Hello and a warm welcome to The Federal. I'm Neelu Vyas. Pakistan perhaps is going through one of its worst economic crises since its formation in 1947. Skyrocketing prices of essential commodities, including diesel and petrol, bad policy making, political mismanagement, and to top it all, all factors like uh, the losses by the floods in 2022, Russia-Ukraine conflict, all these factors have pushed Pakistan on the brink of collapse. How will Pakistan come out of this dead end? I'm joined by a very special guest, uh, Murtaza Solangi, who is a veteran journalist who joins us from Islamabad, and he's currently the executive editor of Nayador Media. Mr. Solangi, welcome on The Federal, and a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you. Mr. Solangi, my first question is, uh, Pakistan, for last three, four years, really has not been doing very well economically. Now, the current situation where we are seeing skyrocketing prices of things like diesel and petrol, diesel almost hitting 280 rupees, according to the Pakistan currency, and 272 rupees of petrol, uh, pet a, li a liter of petrol. Uh, was Did you, did you really uh, expect that Pakistan will land in a situation like this? I think it was a ticking time bomb. It was bound to happen because uh, our power elite over uh, several decades uh, did not manage its uh, financing. Uh, we uh, created less wealth and we spent more. Okay. So that's not sustainable uh, right. for any country. Um, it has something to do with uh, world politics, the uh, Cold War uh, after Second World War. Uh, we happen to, uh, you know, align uh, ourselves with uh, the Western Bloc. Um, mm -hmm. And we somehow um, reaped the strategic windfalls. Uh, from uh, that relationship with the United States and uh, the West. Um, but, you know, we did not restructure our economy uh, on self-sustaining basis. And sadly, we did not invest in our people. Our educational standards have been going low. We spend one of the very um, lowest in terms of GDP on but, education. Uh, but sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Murtaza, for this kind of a situation to arrive and that to of this scale, uh, who would be really accountable? Would you hold the policy makers accountable? Would you hold the ruling elites of the day, the people who were sitting uh, on the powerful positions? Would you blame them? Or would you really blame the geopolitical situations with which Pakistan uh, aligned uh, itself, you know, by default or for any other reason? Politics is always local and the political outcomes are always created by local conditions. Nobody imposed uh, their will on the power elite of Pakistan. Uh, every relationship has two sides. So I would not blame anybody else other than the power elite of Pakistan, uh, who did not think it through. And they only uh, thought about their own uh, narrow self-interest. And that's how we have ended up in this royal mess that we are in today. Um, but as an eternal optimist, and as they you know, say that, when you are in a bottom pit and you can't go further down, probably it's the time for you to go up. You know, probably within every crisis, there's an opportunity. Within every crisis, there's a seed of overcoming, overcoming it. So I can only hope and pray that uh, uh, not only the power elite, but the people of Pakistan uh, would, you know, rise to this occasion. 
uh, and not only stabilize the economy that we will probably, um, we will uh, go through this uh, IMF deal and probably uh, next year we will, we would probably have to go for another IMF program. But Mr. But Mr. Uh, Mr. Solanki, a uh, lot of people are saying that, you know, Pakistan doesn't have an option but to depend on the International Monetary Fund and to appease uh, the IMF. Uh, the government has come out with a mini budget, but there is so much pressure on the life of a common man. Now, how will you really relate the two? I mean, how long will the common man in Pakistan suffer and how much he will have to suffer for this? The common man probably would suffer till they raise their voices and their voices become crescendo. When their voices are amplified and organized to push back the politics of the power elite. But don't you think because, that's already happening? Don't you think that is already happening? Well, I see noise. Okay. Noise is not probably a, po a positive energy. Sometimes uh, void, white noise is a distraction. Only organized people through a conscious policy making hmm. and real policy alternatives yeah. can uh, make uh, the way forward. So right now, there is a great discussion all over Pakistan. Every common man, thanks to social media, uh, mm -hmm. people are speaking. Um, we have uh, a process going on. Uh, some uh, veterans of different political parties mm -hmm. are organizing seminars across Pakistan in the name of reimagining Pakistan. Um, and those leaders are from all political parties. But so Mr. there's Mr. a great Mr. debate going on across Pakistan, how to, you know, put our house in order. Surely. Uh, you are saying that the debate is already on, but you can hear the noise, but uh, it's, it's not organized. Perhaps the debate is happening. But my question is that uh, Pakistan has defaulted on the loan so many times. More than 14, I guess, more than 14 loans uh, were given by IMF. But still, it seems that the ruling elites never learned a lesson. But with the kind of present scenario which already exists or prevails in Pakistan, do you think that the political class will really learn its lesson or will go back to its old ways of governance and uh, its own uh, style of uh, dealing with the things? You know... Uh, the entire human history will tell you that privileged and uh, uh, powerful classes have never relinquished their uh, uh, powerful positions uh, willingly. They have to be pushed back. That's the lesson of history. So um, I don't think that uh, uh, the power groups, the elites, who are used to uh, skimming milk and cream out of the bones of the people would do it so willingly and easily. Uh, they have to be pushed back. Uh, I only hope that this pushback would not be too violent. It would, it would be rather <clears throat> peaceful and mm. orderly so that we don't uh, end up in another mess because as a student of history, I have seen uh, revolutions, be it China or Russia or Cuba or whatever. And I have also seen the disasters and the uh, authoritarianism uh, they have brought in. So I can only hope and pray that the people of Pakistan through their collective wisdom will find peaceful alternatives to reform their political and economic order. <clears throat> so it rests and serves the downtrodden, the working people, the middle class of Pakistan, and it, it doesn't just uh, 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 suit and serve the power elite that have been ruling us for last uh, seven plus decades. 
But Mr. Solanki, uh, <clears throat> the loan program which could be offered by the IMF, do you think that that will give an instant breather to Pakistan, maybe for some time? But what about the long run? I mean, how do you see the things unfolding? Um, probably around two dozen IMF programs we have uh, gone through. There was only one that we completed in 2016. Uh, we have uh, initiated and left those programs either halfway through or at the very start. Uh, I'm sure we will uh, clinch a deal with IMF in uh, two to three weeks. Right. But until and unless we restructure our economy um, and uh, end the wasteful expenditure of uh, uh, the state and the government, um, until and unless we uh, put an end to bleeding state-owned enterprises, right. until and unless we end the subsidies um, uh, of the power elite, which according to UNDP report of uh, 2021, uh, amount to around $17.5 billion. That's a whole huge chunk of change. Uh, until and unless, uh, you know, we, we had a, a, an 18th amendment of the constitution in 2010, where we devolved around 15 ministries and divisions of the federal government to provinces mm -hmm. to promote right. devolution. But soon after that, our federal bureaucracy and federal government recreated those federal 15 ministries and divisions under new names. So instead of cutting down expenses, we actually increased much. Uh, yesterday, there was a report by one of our uh, economic reporters, Shabazz Rana, that said our um, federal board of revenue uh, was trying to buy vehicles um, um, to the tune of 1.5 billion rupees from a loan given by World Bank. Now, yes. this can't be on for a country that's almost on the verge of default. We have mm. a federal cabinet going around 85. Even United States government doesn't have that big size of a cabinet. So there are just too many uh, holes in this uh, uh, economic uh, scheme. Uh, we are spending less has this and less. Has of money. restructuring begun already? Uh, has it, the, the restructuring you are talking about, the economic restructuring, has that begun already? Taking stringent no. steps, adopting austerity, cutting down the cabinet size, all that, is, is it, has it begun? No, but everybody is talking about it. If you turn on uh, our uh, TV networks, if you go on right. Pakistani social media, if you uh, tune into any Twitter space, you will hear people talking about that. That's the only good news I have, that people are talking about to putting our house in order. People are talking about foreign policy. People are talking about economy. People are talking about reducing the size of government. People are talking about uh, wasteful expenditure. So that's the only ray of hope for me. No, but Mr. Murtaza, only talks and no action in sight. Uh, where will it lead to, uh, Pakistan to? You also have a general election this year. And how do things play out in, in, in this kind of a scenario then? It's well, good that people uh, are talking, but then somebody will have to organize all those th uh, talks into some kind of an action plan. Who is going to initiate that? Will Shahbaz Sharif be able to do that? Because uh, a few weeks ago, I think uh, he said that, you know, I'm ready to sacrifice my political career for the sake of the country. So when he makes statements like these, he looks like somebody who's trying to, you know, uh, abandon his responsibilities. He looks like more in a surrendered kind of a position. So who's really going to take the onus? Who's going to take up the cudgels in the scenario like this? Well, uh... An alternative leadership is emerging uh, and knocking on the doors of the old guards in pretty much every party. I'm sure uh, you are watching the news and you have seen uh, Maryam Nawaz, the right. daughter of Nawaz Sharif, has uh, uh, 
taken over as uh, the chief of her party. Uh, this somehow resembles with the 1980s when Benazir Bhutto took over her party and even sidelined her own mother uh, who right. was head of the party. Um, young Blavel uh, is uh, oh. practically leading uh, his uh, political party and uh, his dad has almost taken the back seat. But all those debates and discussions are ongoing. And I'm hoping that during this campaign, before we uh, hit the election uh, schedule, uh, there will be more voices. Um, thanks to the social media, now the people can't be silenced. Their voices are heard. Uh, just yesterday, uh, this news came out of uh, 1.5 billion rupees spending on uh, luxury vehicles by Federal Board of Revenue. And uh, I tweeted against it and I tagged Chief uh, Prime Minister. And uh, by uh, yesterday evening, the, the orders were issued by the Prime Minister, stop it. So, you know, the people's voices are resonating and right. uh, creating their own energy. So that's right. why, despite, you know, these uh, dark clouds over uh, Pakistan these days, I'm not losing hope. I'm hoping that we will uh, create uh, a self-sustained uh, economic order, a democratic order, and we would uh, find ways to have peace within and peace without. Absolutely. Absolutely. What you're saying is absolutely correct. But uh, I would also like to hear from you as to what is happening inside the homes of the common people in Pakistan. We are just getting to read those loud headlines which are coming across the network saying that, you know, the Pakistan government has dropped a petrol bomb on the people, especially after the mini budget. Though that petrol bomb phrase is resonating all across. But uh, if I may uh, ask you and... Uh, ask you to graphically describe as to what do the prices look like in terms of numbers? Say, for example, the flour, wheat, eggs, bread, all these essential items, what do they cost like? Petrol and diesel, of course, we've been hearing that a Pakistan currency, the petrol price is 272 a liter and diesel is 280, which is really unimaginable. But uh, what about the other essential items? Uh, what, do, what does it cost look like and how are the families or really pruning their budget, it isn't an easy thing for them. These are very difficult times for the people of Pakistan, especially uh, the middle class and the lower middle class and working people. People are doing uh, multiple jobs to put their mind and body together. Uh, this uh, is also um, kicking up the uh, crime rate. A lot of uh, uh, problems are, you know, affecting the people of Pakistan. It's it's becoming really, really difficult. Uh, this uh, uh, feels like a Great Depression uh, of United States. Right. Um, so um, I think, you know, it will be a test. Uh, it will be a tough test um, for the leadership for the common man, this would either uh, create beasts out of ourselves or it may, and I hope it will, uh, you know, help us to be kind and compassionate and help uh, our uh, people who are not so fortunate. People uh, need food, people need clothing, uh, People are taking their uh, children out of uh, good schools. Some are going uh, out of school. Uh, people are compromising on their health. Uh, people are, uh, you know, changing their diet pattern. It's not even uh, possible for a middle class uh, family to buy chicken. Um, sadly, because of the policies of our uh, uh, ruling elite, uh, they didn't make uh, our country food uh, secure. 
this is a region that used to feed that entire region. We were the food basket, especially Sindh and Punjab. Right. Now, for since last year, we are importing wheat. It's a matter of shame. We used to export cotton. Now we are importing it. We are importing pulses, lentils. This is a shame. Um, we, just the, uh, the import of petroleum products, oil, is costing us $27 billion. Our mm -hmm. exports are not more than 34 to 35 billion dollars. While we have to import edible oil, we have to import raw material for, for uh, uh, medicines, we have to import wheat. This is really a uh, 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 shocking uh, development for uh, people uh, who think uh, how our country should be run. But if you look at the the, the geopolitical uh, geopolitical situation, uh, is Pakistan really banking on its uh, friendly neighbors like China, like uh, Saudi Arabia? They could have also given some kind of a bailout package. But is that happening? Are there any talks between these countries, or are there really any differences on this front with the friendly neighbors as well? You know, states have their interests. They don't have human emotions like you and I do. They have to protect their interests. There are no permanent friends, but interests. Uh, you know, uh, after uh, this uh, August 5, 2019 incident when uh, India revoked Article uh, 37 and 35A, right. I remember there was... Uh, uh, only China that uh, stood with Pakistan and uh, probably Turkey and Iran. Even our uh, traditional uh, uh, Arab uh, Gulf states, they did not uh, stand with Pakistan. So countries have their interests. Uh, UAE probably has more investment in India in terms of uh, dollars than in Pakistan. So um, our policymakers have to realize that without uh, making your country strong from within, you can't rely on other countries. Uh, there is no free lunch. Nobody, no country would, uh, you know, uh, vouch out for you. You have to vouch out for yourself. Basically, so, what you're saying. What you're saying is that Pakistan has been left to fend for itself and even abandoned by its own friendly neighbors and from the countries on whom it relied. I think it's a moment of truth for Pakistan. Uh, we have to realize our own potential. We have to protect our own interests. Uh, this rentier state uh, syndrome can't uh, survive for good. US, China, America, Gulf states, Iran, Turkey, you know, uh, just like uh, India has to protect its own interests, we have to protect our own interests. There was a time India was uh, um, uh, an ally of former Soviet Union. Um, that was uh, having a cold war with uh, America and the Western countries. Right. Today, India is the strategic partner of United States. That has happened before our eyes. So I think um, we have to uh, think about our own interests. Uh, we need to resolve our issues with India through peaceful uh, uh, dialogue and find common ground to move forward. Um, we are a neighbor of uh, almost 3 billion people to our north and east. We have to live with China and India. And, you know, uh, with India, we have uh, uh, thousands of years of uh, common cultural uh, heritage. There is more that 
connects us with the people of India than any other part of the world. So we, we, we have to learn to live with each other as peaceful neighbors for the common, uh, uh, for the common good of the people of this entire region. I was also very curious, uh, Mr. Murtaza, to know about, you know, in this uh, economic crisis, how is the military uh, leadership positioning itself? I mean, and also the militant organizations who are very active at some point of time amidst this economic crisis, where are they actually? Well, um, if uh, Pakistan goes down, so does every institution. So I, I'm sure that there is realization everywhere. Okay. And uh, I think uh, the policies of the past uh, can't continue. So I am not pessimistic. I think there is realization. And uh, I see signs of uh, changing attitudes Okay. Um, that's only the way forward. People are talking about truth and reconciliation, talking about okay. our own uh, political history, how we have evolved into what we are now, which is not sustainable. Right. Uh, I would just like you to uh, re-emphasize again about the, the 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 prices of the essential commodities. If I get to hear from you, of course, we've been reading about it. But uh, in the, in the normal course of things, I mean, uh, the everyday items which you need, what do they look like? What does the costing look like? And also, what is the 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 exchange rate of uh, the Pakistan currency right now? Well. Um, the for last few days we have seen some appreciation of rupee, but right. it's uh, standing around two hundred seventy rupees for a single U.S. dollar. Okay, um, and probably it will dance around that figure for quite some time till our foreign exchange reserves are appreciated. Um. If you want to know how things have become uh, expensive. Um, things like I milk, used, eggs, bread. I, I, yes. used to, I used to buy a loaf of uh, bread in uh, 50 rupees in 2018. Right. It has uh, gone up to around uh, 130 rupees now. So almost uh, three times. Um, uh, 20 kilograms of uh, f wheat flour that I used to buy in 2018 in uh, rupees 750 is now costing me over 2000 rupees. So you can have a fair idea that uh, the disposable income of people is uh, dropping very fast. Uh, so that means people uh, below the poverty line are increasing. Almost one third of the people uh, is uh, in that bracket. So the middle class is shrinking. These are the realities that we see every day. Now, let's hope recently the, uh, the mini budget, as we call it, which was tabled by Finance Minister Dar a couple of right. days ago, they increased some amount uh, in what we call Benazir Income Support Program um, to, to the tune of 400 billion rupees. Uh, mm -hmm. for uh, cash transfers to people. But much uh, and more needs to be done to help poor people uh, direct subsidies. Uh, and we need uh, economic reforms right away. 
we can't just be talking about them. Right. Uh, uh, so that all those wasteful expenditures are cut down. You know, IMF is a bank, is a lender of the last resort. They would only want you to balance your expenditures with your income. So if you don't generate income uh, from, uh, uh, you know, levying taxes on people who have more wealth, then you would be end up on piling up all this burden uh, on people through these uh, uh, indirect taxes on petroleum. And, uh, you know, when uh, uh, a lipstick would be a luxury item, uh, when a soft drink would be a luxury item, uh, when uh, probably a packaged milk would be a luxury item, uh, the general sales tax has been jacked up from 17 to 18 percent. So mm -hmm. this is making uh, the lives of the people miserable and this uh, creates situation for more social uh, unrest and anarchy. And therein lies the test of political leadership to channelize that uh, energy into positive energy for a social change. Uh, otherwise, uh, Pakistan has a lot of fault lines that can easily be exploited. But uh, Mr. Solangi, you yourself said that there's a lot of talk all around, but uh, Pakistan needs quick remedial measures. Now, how quick will those decisions be? And if they are not taken, then don't you, uh, I mean, are you not worried or are you not scared that Pakistan will just go the Sri Lanka way? I'm hoping Pakistan will not go the Sri Lanka way. I'm uh, quite optimistic that uh, the IMF deal would go through. Uh, the countries that have already pledged to support Pakistan, including China and Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates right. um, and Qatar, they have tied their uh, dole out with the uh, IMF program. Uh, okay. We already have... Uh, uh, made the arrangements to somehow satisfy the IMF program. So Pakistan will not default. But this perennial uh, you know, crisis will continue till we restructure our economy. Uh, we modernize our agriculture. We um, increase um, uh, the taxes on uh, the social groups that have more disposable income. Um, the, the biggest province of Pakistan in terms of population, Punjab, last year, the agriculture income collected uh, by the Punjab government was less than the taxes paid by a single pharmaceutical company. This I know from a personal <laughs> experience since I talked to that uh, chief of the pharmaceutical company. Now, this okay. is not sustainable. Our real estate has become a black hole. It's it's the, the biggest uh, uh, sector where black money is whitened through our, by our power elites. Uh, if you turn on our televisions, most of the advertisement that you will watch will belong to real estate. That's shameful. That's very unproductive sector of the economy. Um, we are uh, not, you know, uh, operationalizing our manufacturing industry. We are not uh, doing value addition in agriculture. Uh, many of our valuable fruits, including mangoes, go to West because we are not uh, using the latest technology uh, to preserve and protect and uh, uh, making it, uh, uh, you know, good enough to export them. So there are a lot of issues related to our economy that need to be addressed. Uh, the only good thing is that we are now talking about those issues. Uh, that's the only ray of hope for me. Good to see you uh, hoping against hope and we all pray that, uh, you know, the conditions get better in uh, Pakistan and uh, I hope those prayers are answered.
It was wonderful talking to you, uh, Mr. Solangi. And uh, one appeal to the viewers who are watching this interview, please share this video as widely as you can and stay tuned to The Federal. Thank you, Mr. Solangi. Thank you. Subscribe to The Federal's YouTube page for more interesting updates.